Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is provided by Radio Arc. Radio Archives sells high-quality old-time radio collections, pulp reprint ebooks, and pulp audiobooks read by talented narrators. And you can try a sample of all three products by sending an email to detectives at radioarchives.com. In addition, they are in the process of sharing all of the 36,000 transcription discs that they have acquired over the years in batches of 600 files per month. You can receive the first month of these transcription disc transfers for only $59.98 per month, all of which will go to support the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio if you go to transfers.greatdetectives.net. And if you like what you hear, you can... Become a subscriber to the transcription transfers for $60 a month, which is half off the usual price. Just go to transfers.greatdetectives.net to learn more. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Philo Vance, and we are back to chronological order with the last 10 episodes of Philo Vance. The original air date on this one is May the 2nd, 1950, and the title is The Rooftop Murder Case. You see, Vance, our office doesn't handle only murder cases. Sometimes, as in this one, the case is a little less physical, but still, it's interesting. You don't have to convince me that being a district attorney isn't dull, Markham. <laughs> uh, this Joe Somer, whom we're going to see, just what is the charge against him? His partner is accusing him of grand larceny. Oh. I happen to know Somer pretty well, and before an indictment is handed down, I want to talk to him. I liked him. Quiet, always considerate. Uh, nice of you to come with me, Vance. I'm glad of the chance to get out of the office. Good. Well, this is the street you said Somer lives on. This house should be that one. There's a crowd around that house, Vance. Something's happened. No doubt about that, my friend. Let's find out what. Well, there's a police officer over there, Markham. Yes. Let's find out about this. I'm with you, Vance. Right, hey, stop shoving, will you? Hey, pardon me. Sorry. Excuse me, please. Get back, everybody. Get back there. Oh, officer, I'm District Attorney Markham. Oh, sure, and I recognize you, Mr. Markham. It's quite a thing we have here. A fellow lives here, a man named Joe Somer, jumped or fell from the roof of his house. What? He was dead when he hit the ground. Joe Somer, Markham. That's the man you wanted to see. Not right now. It was suicide, all right, Mr. Markham. Almost hit a couple of people when he jumped. That's awful. I uh, found a suicide note in the house. There wasn't anybody home, but the note was right where I couldn't miss it when I went in. I'll uh, turn it in with my report. All right, officer. Well, Vance, I promised you a case. All right, it looks like it's over before it even began. That, my friend, is a matter of opinion. Perhaps there is no larceny case, but I have an idea that instead of it, we're going to have a murder investigation. Anderson, uh, DA in his office. Yes, he is, Sergeant. He he's on the telephone, though. Oh, that's okay. You'll want to see me. No, but I'll let you know as soon as something develops. Five. Hello, Heath. Hi, DA. Just got a report on that suicide note found at Joe Somer's house. Yes. Completely legitimate, DA. We had our experts check the writing. There's no question, but that Joe Somer wrote it. He wrote a suicide note and apparently jumped from the roof of his house. What do you mean, apparently? 
Well, Philo Vance thought it might be murder. Oh, he did? Yes. That guy thinks everything is murder. I'm waiting for the day when there's a murder case that he'll say is suicide. You'll have a long wait, Heath. Vance doesn't often make mistakes. Ah, everybody makes mistakes, D.A., even I do. Not you, Sergeant Heath. Yeah, me. And if I can make him, I guess Vance can make him once in a while, too. The possibility is there, undoubtedly. Well? The only thing is, I can't ever remember Vance being wrong for any length of time. I don't imagine I'll be too long, Mrs. Somer. Thank you for letting me use this desk. Uh, It's quite all right, Mr. Vance, but just what are you writing? Nothing, really, just scribbling. Are there any more pens in this house? You've tried all of them that I could find, including Joe's fountain pen. What's the big idea? I won't know whether or not it's a big idea until later. Right now, I... Oh, there's someone at the door. Excuse me. Oh, go right ahead, Mrs. Somer. Please don't let me disturb you. Any more than you have, you mean. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dale. Mrs. Somer, uh, may I come in? Why, yes. Yes, of course. I have company, as you can see. Oh. Philo Vance, the private investigator. Mr. Vance, this is Alfred Dale, my husband's partner. How do you do? Hello, Vance. It took Joe's death to get you over to our house, didn't it, Mr. Dale? Well, I... Too bad you didn't find time to come here while he was still alive. Uh, Mrs. Somer, I assure you, I... Excuse me, please. Mrs. Somer, I'm finished with those pens. All right. Now, can you tell me what your husband was doing on the roof? I'm trying to find out if he deliberately went up there to commit suicide or if he got the idea while he was on the roof. He left a note, the papers say. Doesn't that indicate he went up there to jump? Not necessarily. And I believe I was asking Mrs. Somer. Oh, sorry. When I left the house yesterday morning, Vance, I asked Joe to fix the radio aerial on the roof. That might have given him the idea. Yes, it might. May I go up and see the roof? If you like. Wait till I throw a coat over my shoulders and I'll go up with you. Might just as well see the place where poor Joe jumped. Like to come up, Mr. Dale? All right. This way, gentlemen. Up these steps to the second floor, then we go up through the attic to the roof. Lead on. There's a light at the top of these steps. I'll turn it on. You gentlemen might have a little trouble in the attic. There's no light there, and I'm afraid there are a lot of trunks lying around. There are in practically every attic. Go right ahead, gentlemen. I'll turn on this light. I'll see you, Dale. Certainly. Very well. You know, there's something about this procession reminds me of the three little Indians. Isn't that ten little Indians? Not after seven of them were killed. You're perfectly right, of course. Careful now. It's pretty dark up here. Indeed it is. Just walk straight ahead, Mr. Dale. There are a few steps leading up to the roof. I have some. You know, there are times when I... Oh! Oh. Oh. Sorry, I must have kicked one of your trunks. It can stand it. Find the steps all right, Mr. Dale? Yes, they're right here. It's a good thing you brought your coat, Mrs. Summer. Yes, I suppose it is. Well, so this is the roof from which your husband jumped, fell, or was pushed to his death. Pushed? My husband killed himself, Vance. There, see, there's the aerial I told you about. Look over here on the other side of it. You see where there's new wire around the insulator? Yes, I do. Apparently, your theory was right, Mrs. Somer. I imagine so. Hmm. Well, what else do we do now that we're up here? Not a thing. We've done everything I wanted to do. But what's more important, I've found out everything I wanted to know. I'm just about to go to bed, Markham, but I thought I'd call you and report what happened today at the Somers' house. You know, I'm very anxious to hear. What'd you find out? Well, first of all, I met Joe Somers' partner, Alfred Dale. You did? We went up to the roof. Vance, what's happened? That was a shot. Vance, are you there? What happened? It's all right, my friend. Good. I'm lying here on the floor, out of reach of any second bullet. Besides, there's no light in the room now. Somebody fired at me from the fire escape and got the lamp instead. But, man, how can you be that calm? Somebody just tried to kill you. Yes, I know. And that means you were right. That Somers' death wasn't suicide, but murder. And the murderer was just close to you. That isn't the only thing the shot meant, Markham. It also meant that I am very close to the murderer. You're a smart dame, you are. 
Your husband knocks himself off, and what do you do? You Tony. come running to me. Tony. What is this, a playground? Tony. Tony, Tony. What do you expect from me? Oh, Tony. You think I'm going to knock myself out crying? I get smart. You're cute and I like you, but keep away from me for a while. But I don't understand why. You don't understand why. I'll tell you why. You inherit a lot of dough. That special clause about suicide in your husband's insurance takes care of you. Me? I'm a mug. All right, so you go for me. So the cops find out. So what'd they say? What can they say? What can they say? They can say I knocked off your old man so I could get you in that dough. But Tony... But Tony, you can butt Tony me for now. It'll... So, there she well, is. Got you two together. All right, now, Lila, take it easy. Now, this is the dame that took my place. I was hoping I'd find her here. I'm going to turn her inside out. I'm going to... Oh. <gasps> out. <sighs> now, you heard me. I said out. Oh, no, you don't. I don't get rid of easy. Nobody's moving in till I get ready to move out, and I'm not ready yet. Oh, look, get out of here, Lila. Why? Because you slapped me? Come on. You slapped me before, and I stayed. What do you... Yeah, 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 stop, yeah. Stop pushing me. When I say out, I mean out. Tony, you'll be awfully sorry sure, about this. Sure, sure, sure. I'll make you out. remember it. Tony, let me in. Let me in. I'm sorry, sweetie. Oh. I guess Lila's got a temper. Tony, you guess she has. You're a pretty Tony. good guesser. I'd hate Tony. to think what that girl would have done to me if you Tony, hadn't stopped her. Right now, I'm thinking about what she's going to do to me Tony. because I did. Now, look, Markham. You listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. I don't doubt that, Miss... Uh... Oh, just call me Lila. I'm going to hand you the murderer of Joe Soma. Hand him to you right on a silver platter. Well, that's all very well, Lila, except that indications are that Soma committed suicide. He left a note. I don't care what he left. I know a guy who wanted him dead. Just fool around with that. <laughs> wishing someone were dead rarely is fatal to a victim. Huh? Well, Tony didn't only wish. He gets what he wants. And he wanted Mrs. Soma. Joe Soma was in the way. Tony got rid of him. I don't know how, I just know he did. All right, Lila. Let's concede for a moment that you know he did. How do you prove it? That isn't my job. You're the district attorney, aren't you? I was, when I looked last. Oh, very funny. Uh, just a moment, I want to call Philo Vance. Well, you'd be better off calling a cop and having him pick up Tony. Up until now, Lila, I've been a pretty good judge of my own welfare, thank you. Hmm. Hello, Vance speaking. Uh, Markham Vance, listen, there seems to be more and more confirmation of your murder theory about Joe Somer. Well, I'm glad to hear it, Markham. Actually, and originally, it wasn't a theory, merely an idea, despite that suicide note. Which has never been explained. But which will be. Good. Now, what's the extra confirmation you called me about? Well, there's a girl in my office. Markham. A girl named Lila, who is the ex-girlfriend of a racketeer named yes. Tony Lester. She's been superseded by, guess who? Mrs. Somer. Oh, now, Vance. Well, it had to be Mrs. Somer, or it wouldn't have had any connection with this case, in which event you wouldn't have called me. Reasonable? Reasonable, understandable, and accurate. That's what it is, Vance. Now, this girl claims Tony is the kind of character who wouldn't let a mere murder stand in the way if he wanted something. How right that is. Please, Lila. What? Uh, nothing, Vance. I wasn't talking to you. Oh. Well, I thought I'd let you know about this development. Well, thank you. Now I'll let you know something. Yes? Despite the suicide note, which I'll explain some other time, I'll repeat that it definitely was murder. And I'll tell you something a little more important. And that is? That I also know who pushed Joe Somer off the roof. This is District Attorney Markham. The rooftop murder case began with the apparent suicide of Joe Somer. Vance, believing Somer was murdered, has found substantiation of his theory, despite the presence of a bona fide suicide note. Inasmuch as Vance insists it is a murder, I know we have three suspects. Tony Lester, a racketeer, Alfred Dale, Somer's partner, and Somer's widow. To continue our investigations, I have met Vance in the office shared by Somer and Dale. Vance, I found the partnership papers right here in the desk drawer. Uh, Vance, you're not listening to me. Oh, yes, I am, my friend. I was just trying out all the office pens. Are you through now? No, there. 
You now have my undivided attention. Good. What does the partnership contract say? Uh, that in the event of death of one partner, the other partner takes over completely. Mm-hmm. Now tell me, is Alfred Dale the murderer? I've just found his motive. Yes, you most certainly have. <laughs> Issue promptly evaded. <laughs> Very well, tell me this. What are you trying all those office pens for? I tried all of the pens at Somer's house. With the cooperation of the homicide department, I borrowed the suicide note Somer left. And I can tell you definitely, none of the pens wrote that note. In fact, I don't believe any of the pens in this office were used either. But the note was definitely written by Somer. So you keep telling me, and I agree that it was. What's the answer? You think Somer wrote a suicide note? The murderer knew he wrote it with the intention of killing himself, but acted regardless? Hardly. What? Well, well, what's going on in here? Oh, hello, Mr. Dale. This is District Attorney Mark. How are you? How do you do? We've been using your office. So I see. We have a search warrant, Mr. Dale. It's entirely legal. It's a little embarrassing. You'll have to admit that, legal or not. Mr. Dale, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about any embarrassment that might be caused you in this office. Uh, what do you mean? Yesterday, when you and I and Mrs. Somer were on the way to the roof, the attic was very dark. It was that. You were in the lead, but you avoided a trunk that I promptly bumped into. What? Yes, that's true, now that I recall it. Mrs. Somers said you'd never been in that house before, yet you avoided the trunk. Oh, I have, uh, I have very good eyesight. Or a good memory. What do you mean? I just don't want you to resent our being here, that's all. We do have good reason, don't you think? I don't think I have anything to say. That, Mr. Dale, is probably the smartest thing you've said since you came into this room. What does that mean? That I'm due to be arrested any moment on suspicion of murder? I wouldn't say that. Not any moment, Mr. Dale. I want to be very sure of my proof before Mr. Markham makes any arrest in this case. I'm sorry. Uh, You'll never know how sorry I am. I went to the district attorney. She's sorry. She rats <laughs> on me. Now she's sorry. Look, I'm getting tired of kicking you out of my apartment. Now beat it, Lila. Oh, let me stay, Tony. I won't be any trouble. Just, just let me hang around. Oh. Oh, you're expecting that summer, Dame. She's going to be here and... Shut oh. up, you. Don't you talk about it. Don't even say her name. Oh, I'm not good enough to say her name, huh? I'll say it. I'll scream it so that everybody can hear her. Shut up, I said... <laughs> All right, get out. Get out fast before I change my mind and start tossing you out. What, are you gone? Tony. Tony, darling. Tony, Tony, darling, you make me sick. How did I ever go for a dame like you anyhow? Sometimes I think I'm... Okay, Lester, open it up in there. Who is it? Sergeant Heath, homicide. Open up. Oh, you really did it to me, didn't you, Lana? I gotta get out of here. I can't stand a pinch right now. Tony, Tony, I left the door unlocked when I came in. Oh, you dope. You... Okay, Lester, hold it. You're not going anywhere. According to you. According to me, I'm leaving right this minute. Hold it, I said. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks for the warning shot. I can take a hint, Heath. You want me to go with you? I I go. Oh, Tony, Tony. Come to think of it, even oh. you'll be better company than this. What is it you want it now, Mr. Vance? All the clippings you have on a man named Joe Somer. I don't imagine there'll be too many. Well, if his name was ever in our paper, we'd have the clips in an envelope. You don't want the stuff on a suicide, do you? No. Ah, it's a good thing those clippings haven't been filed yet. T to T U T U to S S S E S E S E S U. Oh, here we are. Silly, Sabotsky, Skelly, small. Small, small. Oh, here we are. Somer. Joe. Here's his envelope, Mr. Vance. He feels kind of thin. Well, I expected that. Now, to see what's in it. Mm-hmm. Two clippings. One dated yeah. five years ago. A little item about the marriage of Joe Somer and Dorothy Blaine. The other... Mm. Interesting, huh? Mm, very. This first clipping is even more revealing, however, in the light of the second one. Listen to this first one. Introduced only three months ago at a beach club, Dorothy Blaine and Joe Somer culminated a whirlwind romance in marriage at the home of so-and-so last night. Couple left for a honeymoon in Bermuda. Well, that's not too unusual. In view of this, it is. Listen, here's the second clipping. 
Joe Somer, local businessman and partner in the firm of Somer and Dale, was taken to Mercy Hospital this morning, suffering from a nervous collapse. Yeah, yeah. According to Alfred Dale, only his fortunate earlier arrival at the office prevented his partner's suicide. That, that means something, huh? It does to me. It's going to mean a whole lot more to Alfred Dale. <laughs> Oh, it's you. Tony, I waited out here on the street to find out what would happen to you. So I, what? I heard you were arrested. You heard I was arrested. Sure, I was arrested, but I'm out. Do they think you killed my husband? How do I know what they think? All I know is I'm getting out of town. I'm going with you. Now, don't be a dope. I need you like I need a hole in the head. You're taking me. I'm going home to pack right now. I'll meet you at the airport in an hour. Now, listen. You better take me, Tony. It'll be so much better for you if you do. <laughs> Look, I'm a busy man, Vance. I can't be running around town just because you call me and want me to be somewhere. You won't be bothered very much longer, Mr. Dale. That's good. I wonder why Mrs. Somer doesn't answer her bell. You'd better try it again. Did it ever occur to you that perhaps she isn't home? Did it ever occur to you that this house might be watched? And if she weren't home, that man across the street, who happens to be Sergeant Heath of the Homicide Department, would have told me. But I still have... Mr. Vance. Yes, and Mr. Dale, your husband's partner. You two remember each other, of course. Naturally. We're coming in, Mrs. Somer. Yes, of course. I really don't know what I'm doing here, Mrs. Somer. I don't either. What is it you want, Vance? We want to go into the living room, for one thing. We'll talk out here, if you don't mind. Oh, but I do. Well. Well, what's that I see in the living room? A trunk. Going somewhere, Mrs. Somer? Come in, gentlemen. Yes, I was going somewhere. I was leaving town. Any objections, Vance? Definitely. Mrs. Somer, do you own a gun? Of course not. What kind of a question is that? Figure it out. You see, the person who killed your husband fired a shot at me the other night. You're convinced that someone killed my husband? Yes. That he didn't commit suicide? That's right. Dale, do you own a gun? Why, uh, I... Oh, come now. It'll probably be on record if you do. All right, Vance. I own a gun. And I carry it. I'll take it if you don't mind. You are. Thank you. Pardon my back a moment, Mrs. Somer. Sure. Vance, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what are you trying to Stop do? Stop right there, Dale. I want you to remember something for me. Just one second while I lay your gun down on the table. Now. Now what? Mr. Dale, do you recall that about six or seven years ago your partner tried to commit suicide? Yes, I do. You left a suicide note at that time. What happened to it? Why, I... I don't know. I do. It's the same suicide note the police found in this house just after Mr. Soma was pushed off the roof. It had to be. There wasn't a pen in this house or in your office that matched the pen or ink used in that letter. The police found the first suicide note, planted here to indicate Soma really did it the second time. What are you trying to prove? And if it's the fact that I murdered my husband, let me inform you that I never even knew him when he tried to kill himself the first time. That's correct, you didn't. Oh, I see what you're driving at. That's good. I took the note six years ago, kept it, killed Soma the other day and left the note here, and you thought I was in this house before when you discovered I didn't trip over the trunk in the darkened attic. Is that what I'm driving at? Well, it, it must be. But I won't stand for it, Vance. I, I won't be framed for murder. Stop I'm right where you are, Dale. Do yourself a favor. Don't make me force you to stay. Mrs. Somer. Yes? You killed your husband, of course. So you say. So I say, and so I can prove. And you know I'm not bluffing, don't you? You knew you gave yourself away up on the roof the other day. That's the reason you tried to kill me in my apartment. Yes, I know you're not bluffing. I realize what I did. And I realize that I've got to kill you now. You realize that too, don't you? Vance, she's picked up my gun. She won't use it. Oh, no? Now, Mrs. Somer... I won't use it, huh, Vance? That's what you think. Vance, my gun is loaded. He knows. And he must know that I'm going to shoot both of you now. The gun won't fire, what? Mrs. Somer. I took out the bullets when I turned my back on you a moment ago. Now I'll take that gun away. Thank you. That will be all, Mrs. Somer. All that is, except my explaining to Mr. Markham how I knew it was you. <laughs> Oh.
Well, Vance, I guess there isn't anything more to tell in this case except the most important thing of all. How did you know it was Mrs. Sommer? First of all, we know from her confession that she found her husband's old suicide note. Vance, please, how did you know she was the murderer? Well, Markham, she claimed she was not at home when her husband allegedly jumped to his death. Yes? She said he went up to the roof to fix a radio aerial. And that's what gave him the idea to come down, write the suicide note, then go back and jump. That was her story. She said she hadn't been on the roof after her husband was killed until she went up with Dale and me. Yet she knew the aerial was broken. Well, she could have known that without going up there, Markham. A yes. wire dangling, bad reception if a radio set were in good order, a number of ways. There was one thing she couldn't know, though. What was that? How it had been fixed. She walked right over to the spot where a new wire had been wound around the insulator. Yes. Now, the only way she could have known that was if she had been there when her husband was fixing it. Or, of course, immediately after which wasn't likely. It couldn't have been immediately after, Vance. She had to leave the house after pushing him off the roof. She probably left by a back exit, went shopping, and returned in time to hear the bad news. Undoubtedly. Uh. When she walked to the aerial, she knew she'd made a mistake. But she wasn't sure that I knew what she had done. Oh? She tried to kill me so as to be on the safe side. But then, when I let her alone for a while, she thought perhaps I hadn't noticed her error, and she didn't try to kill me again. Yes. I let her alone, as you must realize... Because I wanted to be absolutely sure about her. I know that. Her motive was money. Money and her love for Tony Lester. Vance, one thing has always puzzled me about this case. You never knew Joe Somer. All you saw was his covered body the day we went up to his house. Yet, you didn't believe it was suicide even then. Why? Something you said, Markham. Something I said? Something you and the police officer said, rather. You told me how considerate a man Joe Somer was as we were driving over to see him. Yes, that's right. The policeman said that Somer narrowly escaped hitting some people who were walking in front of his house when he jumped. Oh, I see what you mean. A considerate man would have made sure he wasn't going to injure anyone else even though he had decided to do away with himself. That's right. Uh -huh. Of course, I wasn't sure. But subsequent events convinced me I was right. All I can say is that fortunately for us, we had you to get to the bottom of this murder. Thank you, but that's completely unimportant. The only thing that matters is that when we reached the bottom of the murder... We reached the end of the rooftop murder case. Welcome back. This is a case where the murderer outsmarted herself. If she had not planted the suicide note, I think that most people would assume that her husband fell from the roof accidentally. And that would answer Vance's immediate concern that he had jumped in such a way that he nearly hit two people. Now, the gangster referenced a suicide clause in her husband's policy, but a suicide clause wouldn't generally mean an extra payout. Uh, generally, a, a suicide clause says that you can't commit suicide and have your beneficiaries collect. But oftentimes, in modern-day policies, there's a time limit on that. For example, 12 months or 24 months, sometimes that's set by statute. I did love the almost meta part where Markham was dumbfounded about what Vance guessed about the woman in his office. 
And Vance essentially said, well, logically, she is going to be tied up in this, or you wouldn't be calling me about it since we're in the middle of this murder case. And then, of course, Markham being Markham, Vance had to explain when something wasn't a clue. When Markham was like, aha! Well, she knew the radio aerial wasn't working. And Vance is like, yeah, she could have known that without being on the roof. That's not the clue. All right, well, listener comments and feedback now. And we have a comment from Deborah, and this one comes from uh, the Spotify Q&A, and she wrote on a recent episode of Follow Vance, Thank you, Adam. I enjoy your podcast. I have to admit, I like less polished sound. I don't want it to sound too new. And I think this may have been one of the first few episodes where I was talking about radio archives. And I think that there are two sides of this. There is something to be said for sound having like that sort of scratchy uh, feel. You know, that thing that makes it sound like authentically old that uh, may appeal to some listeners. And even when it comes to authenticity, when we are listening to an old-time radio recording where it's been cleaned up and it sounds very pristine, we're probably listening to it at a quality and level that's far greater than what original listeners heard. Uh, You know, unless they had very high-end radio sets and they were, you know, perfectly located near transmitters. When you're listening to an old-time radio program, and it's got some of those defects, you know, you you have to think you're probably listening to it to a similar quality that a lot of people heard it, you know, depending on the quality of their sets. If you've just got, like, an okay radio set or an okay sound system, that listening experience is not going to be all that different from someone listening online to a 32 kbps recording that's sort of at that bare minimum level of being able to be listened to now if you like those sort of recordings the good news is there are always going to be a lot of them for various reasons Uh, there are so many recordings out there where what we have are digitalized files that based on recordings that come from like you know multiple generations out from the original transcription disc and have been transferred and are copies of copies and that's the best we're going to get for some uh, programs those are always going to exist and we'll play them when that's the best we have available But I also think that there really are benefits when it comes to listening to higher quality, more first generation uh, material. Even if that audio is much higher quality than your average radio listener during the golden age of radio may have enjoyed. Beyond it sounding nicer, I think it makes it more attractive to people who have never heard programs from the golden age of radio. I know that listening to a lot of imperfections is not going to be appealing if you're not already a dyed-in-the-wool fan. And there's something about radio and about audio that makes it feel a bit more timeless. When you're watching a black and white movie or TV show or an old program from the 70s, or I guess the 80s or 90s now as I'm getting old, you can't help but be filled with the awareness that you're watching people from another time, another era. And, you know, when you're talking about movies and TV shows from the 50s, uh, people who lived a long time ago and are very different from yourself. You don't necessarily have those same constant reminders if you're listening to a high-quality radio drama that sounds like really crisp and fresh. And I also think that 
even if it's not something that the original listeners, many of them, uh, could have heard, there are also little bits of artistry that kind of get lost when you get into degraded audio. One example, probably my favorite music program from the golden age of radio is the Hour of Charm. This was a program featuring Phil Spatoni and his, and I quote the group name, All Girl Orchestra, and Evelyn and her magic violin. Now, I have to admit, I love the chorus. Their voices are beautiful, and Spitalny just had great taste in the music that he played. But the big feature of Evelyn and her magic violin, I didn't get that. It sounded like a pretty decent violin. Good performance, but I didn't see why it was such a highlight of the program. But most of the recordings of the Hour of Charm are just kind of decent. You know, you don't have a whole lot of really high-quality recordings. But I listened to one recently, and I enjoyed this so much. The chorus sounded better than ever. But then we got to the violin, and and I heard Evelyn playing, and I finally got it. And it was just a small, fine detail, and I think it's really hard to pick up if you don't have uh, a high-quality recording, or if you weren't there in the auditorium where she was playing. And, and certainly that has applications to audio drama. You can appreciate fine details of an actor's performance. Subtleties that they uh, bring that, you know, are going to be lost if you're not listening to the best quality sound. So it's an interesting uh, comment, I, I and I think there really are points both way. When there's decent, listenable audio, I'm not going to turn it down. But when we've got an opportunity to play something better with better quality, I'm certainly going to go for that. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Edel. Edel has been one of our Patreon supporters since April of 2021, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for the support, Edel. And that will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review us wherever you download this podcast from. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Philo Vance, but join us back here tomorrow for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where we will conclude the story from Tuesday with... Johnny Dollar. Who? Johnny Dollar, the insurance investigator. This is Miss Abbott, isn't it? Yes. What are you doing in the stable office? Waiting for you to call me. Your father threw me off the farm a few minutes ago. A man named Cully, who works for your dad, said he really didn't mean it. Said he'd fix it up for me to talk to you. Cully? I guess that's why he asked me to phone the stable office. You told me the horse wasn't injured, shouldn't have been destroyed. I hope you didn't believe all that, Mr. Dollar. Well, now, look, I've got to settle a $65,000 claim on the death of a racehorse. The carcass was cremated, and I have no evidence that the horse was destroyed or even injured. I don't know what to believe yet, but I can tell you this. Don't ever talk to an insurance investigator the way you did earlier today, not unless you can back it up. My, you sound grim. You sound like it's a laughing matter. Hardly anything's a laughing matter. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box 13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.